Good evening. We continue our study this evening with the question, why I love the Lord? Or maybe we would put it this way, why do you love the Lord? This morning we were able to answer with two of the um, responses to that question or to that statement. I love the Lord, number one, because He's good to me, and number two, because He never breaks His promises. We're going to look at the last three that are listed here. Number three, He gives to all, especially to the undeserving. Number four, He teaches me how to love and to forgive, and He, he wants me when others may not. And so we're going to look at each one of those, beginning with the number three, and that is, this is why I love the Lord, because He gives to all, especially to the undeserving. You know, it's very interesting. There are some that believe that they have to be deserving. But the truth of the matter is, when Christ died on the cross, He died to provide salvation for all individuals. How many of those were deserving? How many of those were deserving for an innocent man to die in their stead? To suffer and to bleed and to die and to be mocked and cursed? How many, I wonder, were deserving? Really, when you boil that down, no one really is. No one really deserved for that innocent person to die in their stead. And so God gives to all, and especially at least in the human mindset, to those that you would not think even deserve a second chance, and that's what's important. Because in our mindset, we might look out upon mankind and we might think, now, I think these folks over here, they deserve a second chance, but I'm not so sure that these folks deserve a second chance. But God looks down upon all and He has provided everyone an opportunity to have a new life in Him, to, to have forgiveness of sins and the opportunity to have a part in eternal life in heaven. Sometimes we may think, well... Yeah, maybe a person lies a couple times. Ah, you know, I think that would be okay. I think we, we, would, we would say that's all right. They may deserve a second chance, but this mass murderer over here, this person that's killed people, I don't know about that. And maybe we would favor towards some small sin, at least it's something that's in our mind, but when we look at all of these others, we, we might want to categorize and say, no, I don't think that person deserves a second chance. That's a good thing that God did not think that way because He provided salvation for all that would come to Him and it wouldn't matter if it was a little sin or small sin because sin is sin ultimately. In God's eyes, sin is sin. Though in our minds we may try to categorize it or lift one sin higher than the other, God has provided salvation and if they are willing to come to Him, in submission to His will, to obedience to His gospel, then they can have forgiveness and a home in heaven. What a blessing it is to think of this in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Paul is writing to the church at Rome. He says, but God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, the New King James says it this way. It says, but God demonstrates His own love toward us. And certainly, when we look at the cross, we see a demonstration of God's love, His compassion, His mercy, and the extension of that to all that would come unto Him. But it's interesting that in the midst of this description of the demonstration of God's love, it says, while we were yet sinners. So, while individuals even there that were actually at the first century present who had been responsible for placing Jesus there on that cross, while even they were still in their sins and, and in the process of committing that sin, 
Christ even died for them. Now, we have full knowledge, and we know, because we have the historical account of what happened on the day of Pentecost, we know there were some that were there that were responsible for putting Jesus Christ there on that cross, because Peter, in, in preaching that sermon in Acts chapter 2, explains that. He actually convicts them of that sin. And then he shows them the remedy. He shows them the problem of their own sins and then provides the solution. And that is through Jesus Christ in obedience to His gospel. While we were yet sinners, even knowing this, and even knowing that there would be individuals that would live just pretty rough lives, God sent His Son to die for those individuals to give them an opportunity to make amends, to ask for forgiveness, to come to Him. Think of the hope that gives. There have been those that have been in prison for various things, some of them very heinous crimes. And in the midst of that, some have come along and, and through various ministries and they have gone into prisons and taught the gospel to those people who have done just very awful things. And yet we, we know, based upon our own history, that there have been those that have obeyed the gospel. That really did accept the gospel plan of salvation. They obeyed the gospel. They were baptized into Jesus Christ. And though mankind would, would have a real hard time forgiving someone for some of the things those individuals have done, God promises that He will forgive. Why do I love the Lord? Because of His amazing compassion, forgiveness, His mercy, especially to those that are, what in our mind, undeserving. In Luke chapter 18, and you can turn there with me if you will. Luke 18 Beginning in verse 9, we have this parable. And Jesus is speaking to those that had trusted in themselves. They felt like that their trust not being in God, not being in the Savior, they trusted in themselves that they would be righteous before God. And even so much so that they began to despise others around them. They were looking down upon others, but trusted in themselves, not upon God. And so we have this parable of two individuals that go to pray in the temple. You've got one that is a Pharisee, another a publican. And the Pharisee, again, showed that he felt that he was right. And he explains how he's done all of these good things and done right. And, and, and so much so, he's glad that he's not like the other people. And there is the despising that is in this. But then you come down to verse 13. And it says, And then there is that publican who would not draw close, but was standing far off, would not so much as lift his eyes even up to heaven, began to beat upon his own chest, saying, God be merciful unto me, a sinner. One felt like they were right. The other felt like that they knew they needed God because they were wrong. And so you have the one that through humility bows down and, and is really relying upon God knowing that only God can provide that salvation. Interestingly enough, in verse 14, he, Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Because there's some that's going to try to exalt themselves, but then there's others that are humble. And those that would be humble are those that God will exalt as we see from this passage. Some would say, you know, and even in this passage, I think this illustrates maybe many that have a religious mindset. And here you have somebody that has that religious mindset who would look down upon others but are not really relying upon God. And yet there are others that truly are humble and they can see their desperate need for God. And so I love the Lord because He rewards those that acknowledge that they are weak and that they need Him. And so in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, it says, in, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches 
of His grace, wherein He hath aboundeth toward us in all wisdom and prudence. God has blessed us with forgiveness. He's given us an opportunity, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, to be a new creature. And that opportunity has been extended to everyone. Though in our minds we may think, I don't know. I mean, how many would be willing to go to death row and say, I think that's where I want to evangelize, you know? But they need the gospel. They have sin. And they need salvation. And so God promises that if individuals are willing to come to Him, then He will make them a new creature. And so what a blessing that is because uh, we know that we all have sin. We all have a desperate need of salvation from Jesus Christ. And so we have the opportunity then to acknowledge how great God is in providing this forgiveness. And so we love the Lord because He gives to all, especially to the undeserving. We love the Lord because He teaches us. He teaches us how to love. He teaches us how to forgive. As we stated several times this morning, in the passage that we were referencing is 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19, which says, we love Him because He first loved us even though He looked down upon mankind that was in a big mess. He looked down upon His creation, many of which had turned away from Him, rebelled against Him, sinned against Him. He still looked down upon that creation and moved first to provide salvation to set in motion even there from the very beginning, even going back to Genesis 3.15, to set in motion what would ultimately bring the Savior and salvation to all of us. He loved us first. And because we see that, then we are willing to do whatever our God would bid of us. If we notice in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, God teaches us what forgiveness really is. I'm not, I don't think anyone can say, well, you know, I don't, I don't stand in need of forgiveness. No one can say that. We know in Romans chapter 3, though the 3.23, the, the emphasis there is Jew and Gentile. Everyone stands under judgment of sin. Again, the emphasis would remain today. There's not any ethnicity, any nation, any people group that's going to be able to escape that. All are in need of the grace and mercy and forgiveness of Almighty God. And so when I acknowledge that, then we know that we're able to look at God and how forgiving He is, and then it helps me, it teaches me how I need to be in my life. And really, we can learn that from the God of heaven. He says, And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. In the sister passage in Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 13, he says, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So we have an opportunity to learn from how God forgives. And because we see this in the way that He is forgiving, then we too must implement in that in our lives. If we're unwilling to be forgiving, then the principle is there that the Father's not going to forgive us. Now there you have what we would call the model prayer. It's a part of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5-7. through We come to chapter 6, and in the midst of this, we have that model prayer. At the latter part of that model prayer... It says, and forgive us our debts. Forgive us of our our debts as what? We in turn have a part to play there. So as a part of the prayer, he's asking for forgiveness for self as in turn he forgives. I think that's interesting. That is the part of the prayer. It's not just a prayer to say, hey, forgive me and no, no action on my part. But rather as a part of that prayer, forgive me as I forgive. Do we pray that way? 
If we did, it would challenge us, I think, every time we bow our head to pray. I mean, because then now there's a challenge that's laid upon us, and, it, and, it, and then it places it right there upon us to make sure that we also are forgiving of our debtors. In 13, he says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. In the next verse, he says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you don't. If you do not forgive. Then what? Neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. I learned how to be forgiving from my heavenly Father. In Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21, Peter came and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. I mean, if, if he keeps doing it over and over and over and over, I mean, how often should I do this? Seven times? And notice in 22, Jesus said to him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And just, just an unfathomable number, a very large number. He gave a very small number, which seems significant to him. Seven times? <laughs> That's still a lot, isn't it? If somebody wrongs you, you forgive them. They say, I'm sorry. And then they go and they do it again. They come back again. And you're like, Annoyed, and then they do it again, right? And seven times, that's a lot. I'm sure he felt like that was pretty good. Like if I'm doing that, at least that much, I'm being forgiving. And Jesus said, no, even much greater. If our Heavenly Father was not that forgiving, we would all be in big trouble. Big, I mean, everybody, we would be in big trouble. I mean, how often do we bow our heads, personally pray to God and say, Father, forgive me, for I personally have sinned. And then the next day, we're praying again, Father, forgive me. You notice, therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents but for as much as he had not pay his lord commanded him to be sold and his wife his children all that he had and the payment to be made and the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying lord have patience with me and i will pay thee all then the lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt but then the same servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants which had, which had owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him. He took him by the throat and saying, Pay me that thou owest. His fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Verse 30. And he would not. He would not. But he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee. I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due him. So likewise, my heavenly Father, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one, his brother, their trespass. The power is given there and the lesson that has been given provided that answer. Peter wanted to know, how, how often? I mean, how does this work? And Jesus, the master teacher, provided the teaching. And the answer is given with significant force. Do we learn how to be from giving by and from our God? We do. James chapter 1 and verse 22 tells us to be doers. And so we have the illustration, we have the teaching, we have the commands, everything is provided us. And now the question is, how are we going to live it? Are we going to do it? I love the Lord. 
because He gives to all, especially those that are undeserving. I love the Lord because He teaches me how to love. He teaches me how to forgive, which is sometimes very hard, but He teaches me how significant, how important it is. And I love the Lord because He wants me, even when others may not. John chapter 3 and verse 16. God loved. He looked down upon man and man was in a big mess. Well, I mean, man had just really messed that thing up and that's what often happens if you give something over to man. He just messes up. And in the Garden of Eden, they just chose, they made the wrong decision. They shouldn't have listened to the serpent, the tempter, but they chose to disobey and they were punished. And then as we continue to see that moving on and on, Individuals choosing the wrong path in disobedience. And God looked down upon mankind and moved to provide salvation. God loved the world and He gave. Instead of looking down upon the world and providing no provision, He looked down with great love and compassion and provided what we would call a, a, a remedy, a solution through Jesus Christ and the power of His Gospel, so that mankind could be saved. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, it explains to us that this was done for the whole world. So this is the opportunity. Jesus, when He died on the cross, He died to provide, to give access to the whole world. Though not everyone will take advantage of that. Not everyone will access the grace of God by faith, according to Romans chapter 5. Yet He provided that sacrifice for the whole world. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17, it teaches us that that is there. It's been provided so that whosoever will, they can come. And really, that's the great invitation trying to call people to come unto Him, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon Learn of me. I'm meek and low in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. That is the call. Come unto me. There are some that feel like maybe they're not wanted. And maybe they come into this world, and that's what happens. Unfortunately, here of late, I have seen that happen many times with children that are passed in and out, and sometimes even in our own community, there are those that are treated as if they are unwanted. And they are left by family members or whoever aside and just left in the hospital for whoever to deal with, and the parents walk away from children. They do it every day. We get calls and texts of things like that happening in our own community, not far away, not in Asia or Africa, right here in our county. But why I love the Lord is even those individuals, though they come into this earth and they've got a hard road to hoe, as some would say, you know what I'm saying? That Their life's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard. God wants me and He wants them even when they've been rejected by others. Even when there have been those that looked upon them and maybe they didn't show that love and compassion to them, they can know that they have a heavenly Father who loves them, who thought of them even before they came into this world and made provision for them to be in heaven with Him who prepared a home, a mansion above, there waiting for them. What a God. What a Savior. I love the Lord because He is so good to me. When He promises, He's going to keep it. He's not going to break those promises. I acknowledge that I am undeserving, and yet God has looked down even upon me and has provided a remedy for me to have hope. And what a blessing that is. I love the Lord because of he, he provides the perfect example of what it means to be loving and what it means to be forgiving and calls me to follow after Him. And I love the Lord 
Because when there may be others around me that do not want me, I know that God does. I know that He loves and that He cares. Tonight, if you need to obey the Gospel, you need to come to that Heavenly Father who does care, who provided for you, will you tonight believe that Jesus is the Savior, the Christ, the Son of God? Turn away from your past in repentance. Confess with your lips, yes, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And be willing to have your sins washed away, to be born again of the water and of the Spirit. John 3, 3 and 5. You can be baptized tonight for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38. Or, if you've allowed Satan to turn you away in a, in a path you never intended to go and you've gone there and you need to come home, the prodigal son is a beautiful picture in which the Heavenly Father is there waiting with open arms, pleading and waiting, hoping and desiring for His child to come back, turn away from the rebellion and come back home unto Him. Maybe tonight you need to do that. If you have a need, we have an invitation song that is prepared. Won't you come? It's together we stand and as we sing.